Well, it's the end of another year, so here is another year-end reading list where I briefly go over the books I've read this year. All of these books, almost all of these books except for the last one, I've already reviewed on this channel. So I've, I've already talked about each one at length, and I will try and just give a brief summary of each one instead of talking on and on like I usually do. Um, but, but first let me mention a couple of things. One is... I actually haven't read that many books this year, and that's actually true every year. Uh, I, I mention that because this is BookTube, and most people on BookTube are voracious readers. That's why they're on BookTube. I actually have always been a very slow reader and an easily distracted reader. So I'm on BookTube not because I read voraciously, but just because I happen to like to talk about the books I read. Uh, so this year I've read 12 books, which is not great, but fairly typical of me. Uh, actually, let me talk briefly maybe about the circumstances of this year, because 12 is... In, in a good year I can read about maybe 40 books. So, so 12 is not great, but um, it's, well, it's been an interesting year. Um, Certainly, uh, ever, ever since uh, we've had the baby a couple years ago, uh, my leisure time for reading has been drastically reduced. Um, and then, of course, this year there have been a number of changes. Uh, I've been living in Vietnam, and so Vietnam has had a relatively successful time dealing with COVID. Uh, none, nonetheless, there was a lockdown period in the spring for about a couple months or a month and a half. I don't even remember now. The days all blend together. Uh, during which time I was working from home and somewhat underemployed as my hours were cut. If that had happened to me 10 years ago, before being married and before becoming a parent, that would have been the ideal time to get lots of reading done. Um, but as it was with a toddler, constantly wandering around the house, I didn't get very much reading done at all. Um, I, well, who knows? Uh, I, 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 I used to, when we were in that lockdown period for COVID, I used to think to myself, oh, this would have been so nice if only it had happened before I was a parent. I could wake up late every day, I could have a cup of coffee, I could go for a walk, uh, I could just read all afternoon. Uh, and I, I would fantasize about that to myself, but the truth is, as, as I just got done admitting in a recent video, uh, I have, even during periods where I had lots of free time throughout my life, uh, suffered from a problem focusing myself and tended to waste a lot of time just on YouTube or on watching videos or watching TV. So who knows, e even if it had been ideal circumstances, I might not have gotten a lot of reading done, but I, I fantasized that I would have gotten a lot of reading done. Uh, and then, then we came back to work, and for a period I was going back to work, but I was not busy at work, as things were still kind of slowly gearing up after COVID. And that was ideal time for me to get a lot of reading done. Because I, I was away from home, so I didn't have to deal with the toddler. The toddler was home with the wife. Uh, but but not, not so busy at work. I could take long lunches. Uh, I, I could read a lot during my breaks. And did, did get a fair amount of reading done during those couple months. Uh, th then I started a new job from late August. Um, in addition to the previous job I already had. So I was working full-time at one place and working part-time at another place. And from the end of August, I have been really busy. Uh, that plus a toddler at home. Uh, that plus this new job required me to get up early every morning. Uh, and because I've been working two jobs, uh, it's been seven days a week. Up early every morning, at least six days a week. Uh, and, um, yeah, the getting up early every morning has been tough for me. I'm not naturally a morning person, and neither is our toddler, who tends to stay up late. Uh, so getting to bed on time has been an issue, and making these videos, which typically only get made after the toddler gets to bed at night, has been 
more difficult to fit in my schedule. And I imagine that this may have been visible on my face since around late August, that the videos I've been putting on this channel since late August have been mostly done under a sleep deficit. In other words, I, I imagine I've been looking tired. I, I've certainly been feeling tired. Uh, and I, I feel like that's been affecting um, the, the videos. I've never been particularly articulate, but I, I feel like I've been searching for words even more than usual or stumbling for word, stumbling over my words even more than usual during that time. So, so anyways, th those are the circumstances under which I've uh, gotten these 12 books read. So let's go over them first of all. The first one is The Golden Fleece which I picked up at a bookstore when I was back in America over Christmas. Uh, it's by Robert Graves. I had previously read Robert Graves' um, two, Robert Graves' historical novels, the, the two most famous ones, which are I, Claudius, and Claudius the God, and enjoyed them. And uh, when I saw The Golden Fleece, I thought, ah, great, this is going to be so much fun. Uh, a, a, a classic Greek myth plus Robert Graves. It was actually not as much fun as I was expecting, and I, I, should have, I should have expected that, because Robert Graves is a good writer. He's a serious writer, but he's not always a fun writer. You know, he, he's a bit of work. Um, so this was a bit of a slog at times, um, but I'm glad I read it, and uh, it, I think it did a very good job of making all of Jason's crew come completely alive. Even though I was disheartened that it was a largely demythologized version of the Golden Fleece. So he took all the magic and all the myth and all the magical creatures out of it, which, which I thought kind of spoiled the fun of it. But the, the characters in here... Um, Castor and Pollux and Hercules and Orpheus and all the classic characters from Greek mythology, the characters are still in here. And the, the characters all come through very well in, in this one. All right, uh, next one is Designing Language Courses, a guide for teachers by Kathleen Graves, which I originally started reading for Delta Module 3 and then just kept reading even after I finished Delta Module 3. So this, this is a book for professional development. Uh, which I thought was very well written. You know, it, it was it was a bit of work to get through because it's it's not pleasure reading. I mean, it it, it wasn't it wasn't a difficult read, but it, it was just it it wasn't it wasn't fun. Yeah, you, you know, it, it it was a little bit dry and boring. But that being said, it, it was it was dry and boring just in the sense it was professional development reading. Um, but as professional development readings go, Kathleen Graves made it entirely readable. <sighs> Sorry, I haven't been doing a good job of talking up this book. It, it's professional development, so you wouldn't want to read it for pleasure reading. But Kathleen Graves really made a good job of making this type of thing as readable as it could be. So th this was the best book I've read for professional development. The other work, book I read for professional development is Learning One-to-One. -one. Uh, so as the language schools got shut down in here in Vietnam uh, for a couple months because of COVID, a lot of us were turning to private tutoring. I picked up a couple private classes via um, via Zoom, uh, the, the video calls. Uh, so this book had been on my shelf, but I had never read it before. And I read it, and it was... Okay, uh, didn't blow my mind. It was mostly useful stuff except for the um, the learning styles part, which to be fair was completely in vogue in the field at the time this book was written. Um, okay, uh, the next one was the uh, Chronicles of Amber series. This is something that I heard Steve Donahue talk about on his channel a few times, popped up in some of his Q&A. And it just sounded really interesting from the brief uh, glimpses I got of it from him. But I thought, well, I'm never going to find that here in Vietnam. And then I found it here in Vietnam. It was an, at a used book stall uh, on, on Book Street here in Saigon. Uh, and read the first two uh, books in the series. This is a compilation book, so it's got the first five books in here. 
Uh, the first two are Nine Princes in Amber and the Guns of Avalon. I do plan to continue reading on with this. I, I was just taking a little break where, I, where I, I was incredibly busy and I had other stuff I was clearing out of my reading list. But uh, yeah, obviously I can't wait too long or I'm going to start forgetting the plot points or the characters or, or you know, stuff like that. But uh, I, I feel like a couple months is still okay. I mean, the, these books originally came out within a couple years of each other anyways. So, you know, if I had been reading them in real time as they were published, that's what I would have been doing anyways. Anyway, uh, yeah, Nine Princes in Amber and The Guns of Avalon. Um, so, this series has a lot of fans, and I can definitely see why. Uh, it's incredibly imagina imaginative stuff. Really really imagined sorry really imaginative fantasy that that um, is very interesting to visualize as you're reading it uh, the, the the landscapes the things he's describing it's it's written in a prose uh, a style of prose that's uh, uh, making you work a little bit so not everything is described sometimes it's uh, very sparse on the description, so you have to kind of work to fill in the gaps. And from that perspective, it's not entirely, uh, it's not entirely an easy read. Uh, meaning if, if you're looking for something to just relax and shut your brain off, this isn't it. But, but if you're looking for like some immersive fantasy, uh, this can be it. Um, but yeah, because it's not, it doesn't actually, because you can't actually shut your brain off completely and because you have to work a little bit for this, I think that's part of the reason I didn't make more progress on this series than I did this year, that that and being really busy. Um, but I do plan to continue on with that. All right, Being Wagner um, by Sam and Kello. Uh, at one time, this did actually have a dust jacket on it that had uh, was red and had a picture of Wagner on the front. Uh, my toddler has ripped off the dust jacket, so it's just a plain purple book here. Um, so this is the only nonfiction I read this year, not, not counting the professional development books. The, the only, aside from professional development, the only nonfiction I read this year. Um, so by virtue of, um, by virtue of just being without any competition, this wins the best nonfiction for this year, but uh, it, it, it may well have been my best nonfiction book this year anyways. It, it was interesting to read. It was not very academic, uh, not very heavy, very light and breezy in tone, and that's that's why I went for it. I, I wanted a light and breezy tone, and this was it. So not, not a serious academic study, but a very easy biography to read of Wagner if you're looking for something light. Uh, the Age of Myth, which I enjoyed. Uh, no, I, I, it took me a bit to get into it, but once I got into it, I did enjoy it, and it was very well written. Um, like all fantasy books, this is part of like uh, book one of like a six book series, and this whole series is in fact connected to a different series that the author had done. Uh, and that's that's what makes it hard for me to really get into fantasy books, especially living out here in Vietnam, where it's hard to track down an entire series. But I, I enjoyed this for what it was. Uh, speaking of fantasy books, uh, I'm going to jump ahead to Heart of Dread Frozen by Melissa De La Cruz and Michael Johnston. This was a YA book that I picked up from a bookstore on a whim, just thinking it would be, because it was YA, it would be really light and easy to read. And it is really light, and I guess it's easy to read, but it was just so incredibly boring that it sat on my shelves for a while until I finally got around to reading it, uh, finally finishing it off this year. Th this is the worst fiction I read this year, although it's mostly my fault for picking this up in the first place. Because, I mean, I, I should have known this was going to be really bad. And, and I did. I thought it would be really bad in a fun, entertaining, easy-to-read way. But it turned out to be really bad in, in a boring way. 
Uh, Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman is the best fiction I read this year. Although I almost hesitate to call it fiction. I mean, obviously it's fiction, but it's, it's folklore. So, you know, it's, it's not like you're reading a novel. You're, you're, you're reading it, but at the same time you're getting an, an education in what the Norse myths were. Uh, I found the Norse myths, as I mentioned in my, my review, uh, kind of a cross between um, what I associate with Greek myths, but also having like a fairy tale quality, like I might associate with the Brothers Grimm. Um, more almost folklore than mythic, but I enjoyed that book so much. Uh, Neil Gaiman is a, is a good storyteller. The original uh, myths that he was basing it on are incredibly imaginative, uh, and it was just so much fun to read that. I, I don't have my copy with me because I recommended it to a, a friend and then gave it to him. I, I don't typically reread books in, much anyways, uh, so there's no reason to hang on to it. Uh, and uh, with a book that good, you have to pass it on. So, so no copy to hold up. Tales of Troy and Greece by Andrew Lang. I, I don't have a copy with me here because it's a library book. Uh, as I mentioned in my review of that book, uh, I found the mistakes and inconsistencies in it incredibly frustrating. Um, but I like the author's pro style. So the pro style was good. The proofreading and the mistakes and the consistencies were not great. On the whole, even though it frustrated me, I, I still enjoyed reading it. Next, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien. Uh, no copy here because I was using an online copy. So don't have anything to hold up to the camera. Uh, as I mentioned in my review, this was a reread. I had originally read it back in fifth grade and was returning to it. And it was not as good as I remembered it. Um, but it was still really good. Uh, th the story didn't make as much sense as I thought it did, uh, as I had thought it did from fifth grade. And the, the conflicts in it were not as good as I had remembered them. Um, but the world, world building and the level of detail uh, the, going into the premise w was still impressive on that. This one here I finished on December 15, and I haven't gotten around to reviewing this yet. So this will get reviewed in 2021, I guess, even though I, I finished it just at the tail end of this year. Chomsky's Universal Grammar, an introduction by V.J. Cook and Mark Newsom. This is also professional development. Kind of, although it's not actually that useful for my job as a as a English language teacher. Um, yes, so I, um, I'll I'll talk about this fully in another video when I get around to it. I found the first half of this book uh, a little bit thick, but understandable. I found the second half of this book largely incomprehensible. And I'm not entirely sure if that's my fault or the book's fault, to be perfectly honest. I'll, I'll talk more about that when, when I get into reviewing this um, in, in uh, a separate re review. I'm, I actually have the bookmark here at the beginning because I've been going back to try and reread parts of it in an effort to try and get my head a little bit more around this before I attempt a book review on it. Um, so, uh, th those are the books I finished this year. Few books I've been plotting along with but haven't finished. Uh, this book, as I mentioned in a, my started re, uh, video, when I, when I made the video announcing I was starting this book, I was originally hoping that this would supplement this book. Uh, and it did kind of, but it also turned out that once I started the new job in August and was incredibly busy, I barely had time to read one book, let alone two books. So I just decided to put this by the side and soldier on with this one unaided. I did get about 150 pages into this though before I put it aside. Um, and it's, 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 how many pages are there total? About 700 plus some appendixes. Uh, so uh, it's, it's size of a book. Uh, I think what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm still going to finish this someday, but I've put it aside for now uh, until I clear out some space in my reading list. 
Don Quixote, I've been working on this book for years now, in, in uh, about three years, I think. Embarrassing, I know. Um, I did make some progress on this uh, during quarantine. I did a, a reading spurt on it. Um, and on a recent vacation during Christmas break, I brought this along on vacation with me and got another 50 pages read on it. So I, I you know, you can see I'm, I'm so close to finishing it. I'm just finding this book such a slog, but you know, at this point, you've got to finish it. Uh, and, and I'll finish it sometime this year. No, I, I, I shouldn't promise that. I might finish it sometime this year. Probably finish it sometime this year and then come back with a review. Uh, this book here uh, is, I got this when my school library was closing and they were getting rid of their books. And it was a uh, uh, gorgeous book here, which I've, sorry, let me grab the camera. Uh, you, you, you can see here, it's, it's filled with all these really great illustrations. It's so colorful. It looks like a magazine. And I was thinking I could start reading this in the mornings when I'm having my morning coffee uh, instead of, you know, what I typically do, which is just watch YouTube in the mornings while I'm waking up. I was thinking this could be good for professional development and, you know, be better for myself than watching YouTube. Uh, and I thought the layout of this might lend itself to kind of morning reading. Uh, I'm half asleep in the morning, so I usually go for something not too heavy. Despite the layout of the book, though, the actual content can get pretty heavy. I mean, it talks about moderately heavy. It's, it's not super academic, but it does attempt to talk about a lot of linguistic concepts and the grammar of Old English and the grammar of Middle English and stuff like that. Um, but the biggest impediment to working through this at the moment is it's so big it's difficult to put in my bag for carrying around with me to work. Uh, and so as a consequence, it tends to stay at home. And now that I have an early morning start, I've lost my reading time in the mornings. So I got to about page 170 on this, and then I've just kind of stalled out on it. Um, but I'm, I'm at some point planning on finishing this book as well, once I get into a schedule or find time in my schedule for it. So, yeah, that, that, that's my reading list for this year. So to summarize, two books for professional development, of which the best one was Designing Language Courses, A Guide for Teachers by Kathleen Graves. Uh, three books if you count this one, but, but I haven't reviewed that one yet. Uh, of the nonfiction books, uh, not including professional development, but just general nonfiction, being Wagner is the only one I read, but I, I found it very entertaining. Uh, and then of the fiction books, the worst one I read was uh, Frozen. Uh, and the best one I read was Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. Okay.